Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, today, we continue our aspiring intellectuals special coverage where we have longer and harder conversations on more foundational topics uh, with our guests. Um, it seems that we are at a narrative impasse. The stories we tell are limited. Uh, in the words of my guest today, we are now caught between an outdated style of patriotism and a fatigued pluralist alternative. We're confused about the future of globalization and global interdependence. And I'm very honored to be joined by one of the most renowned historians in this field to discuss some of those issues. Uh, Professor Jeremy Adelman, he is the uh, Henry Charles Leah Professor of History at Princeton University and the director of the Global History Lab, which strives to teach students internationally how to create new global narratives, even across divides. Uh, recently, the Global History Lab has brought displaced persons and refugees into its network. And Professor Adelman is a very accomplished academic, and his focus is global economic and Latin American history. His recent books include this one that I'm holding in my hand right now, Worldly Philosopher, The Odyssey of Albert O. Hirschman, uh, published in 2013. It's, it's a bit too long, so I haven't finished reading it. So I'm, I guess I'm not too well prepared for this interview, P Professor Edelman. But thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be invited. Thanks thanks for the invitation. Uh, and co-hosting this interview with me is Rebecca Roth. She is the chief of staff on our team, basically helping me run everything. So Rebecca, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Tiger. Uh, Professor Edelman, I guess we should dive right in. I mean, sure. The first question I'm going to ask you is not about global interdependence, but about your hockey team. So. Yeah. What is going on on that front? <laughs> <laughs> so I, well, a little confess. So I'm Canadian uh, origin. Uh, so uh, sets the stage maybe for some of the things we might talk about. Um, but my, yeah, my hockey team that I grew up with is the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, for many years. Horrible, horrible team. I mean, we, we know pain, but uh, this is the year they're going to go all the way. And, uh, and it's, it takes me back to my childhood, you know, where I live on the edge. Was the team going to win or not? Uh, anyway, it's, it's, and it's been also interesting to watch uh, professional sports. I'm not a big sports fan, although I'm a big hockey fan. Watch them cope with COVID. Um, and uh, so one of the issues I think we're going to talk about, issues around borders, um, the trade deadline is coming up in, in professional hockey, and there's a quarantine when you go to Canada, but not the other way around. It's asymmetrical interdependence. Wow. <laughs> and so if there is a trade and an American team sends ships a, a player to a Canadian team in a trade, that player has to sit in a hotel room in quarantine before he can hit the ice, whereas it's not the other way around. So I'm really interested as in a natural experiment in because uh, you're an econ uh, major yes, tiger this. yeah of, <laughs> of how this is going to work out there'll be some interesting data from from trade deadline day oh very interesting this could be yeah. some uh, senior thesis topics for for some there you now. go yes, yes. <laughs> no but we, sh we should maybe start with your background and so you brought up yeah. how you're canadian and you love hockey but you also study latin american history you have a, yeah. a very wide range of interests in terms of research and you look at a wide range of topics so maybe we should start there who is Jeremy Edelman, and uh, what does he study? So uh, that's a tough, uh, yeah, tough question. So uh, having written a long biography, I don't think you want the long autobiography version. <laughs> but yeah, I grew up in, in, in Toronto, um, you know, at a, at a time in sort of my generation coming out of a place like that in, a, in that moment of time when public goods were opening up, the world was expanding. Uh, we're in a different zeitgeist now, which is, I think, one of the themes we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, Canada was a, a sort of Canadians at that time imagined themselves kind of on the margins of history, certainly being from a smaller country living beside a big one. Uh, the action was always going on somewhere else. Um, and uh, for a variety of reasons, I was uh, from the time I was a university student, if not a little before, I was interested in Latin American affairs. We can go into what was happening in Latin America in the in the in the 80s, uh, transitions to democracy, making well, actually not just democracy, but a whole set of combined transitions going on, human rights activism, my own 
activism was connected to uh, what was happening in Central America, in particular El Salvador, um, and the issues around civil war and what's called transitional justice. So I spent off and on over the years, uh, about five years in, in, South, in Latin America, um, went to, did my graduate work in the UK, uh, kind of moved back and forth between Buenos Aires and London for too long until I landed at Princeton. And I've been stuck here ever since. That's me. Um, that's fascinating, actually, um, how you, I guess, got to this place. Um, so I guess you wrote just that you're now finishing a book about the euphorias um, and strains of global interdependence, yeah. which may be relevant since our current interdependence regime yes. has never been so tightly um, wound and fragile at the same time. Yep. You wrote that we're living in more dangerous times than ever and yet yep. need each other more than ever. So why don't we kind of start there with just unpacking all of that and like the current situation? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so Rebecca, it really is, it, it is, it's the paradox of our times that never have we been more dependent on each other. And we, we'll get into the dimensions because it is really multiple layers and multiple forms of dependence, environmental, bodily, Right. This one of the effects of COVID was really to remind us that our bodies depend on what happens to bodies in faraway places and vice versa. It's interdependence, not just one way dependence. And we have to model that in careful ways um, and create new narratives for that. Again, something I think we're going to get to. So we're more interdependent than ever in a whole variety of ways. And yet we have a very hard time telling the story about what that means and creating a narrative that allows us to have shared understandings of what we're doing when we're making decisions that govern each other's lives. Um, there, there was a moment in 1945, to give you an example, when that existed. There was a shared sense of purpose. It was initially to fight fascism. It was initially to prevent us from relapsing back into the Great Depression. We can unbundle these if, if, if you're interested. But it gave to the 1945 world system, if, if you will, uh, a self-understanding about what we were doing. It then got fortified by the Cold War in the sense that the liberal quote unquote West had a shared sense of purpose. The not so liberal communist quote unquote East also had its shared sense of purpose, but everybody had one about what we were doing on this planet together. Now, of course, these shared sense of purposes were in tension with each other and the Cold War was a, was, was a rivalry of ideologies and narratives about the future. Uh, and then one side, quote unquote, won, right? In 1989, 1992, this break, uh, and it looked like the whole world was going to be liberal and the term globalization became the term that we strapped to this system of market convergence. Again, we can unpack what that was all about. I'm giving you the historian's overview here. That sense of purpose, right? Uh, the liberal purpose is exhausted. I'm not saying it's dead, uh, it, but it is fatigued, it's tired. It's lacking legitimacy at a time in which we need coordinates that we share. Uh, and that's the dilemma uh, that we're now confronted with. I guess just to quickly follow up on that, Professor Edelman, you talked about how the stories we, we tell are somewhat limited. And you mentioned how previously there were these comparative, competing narratives. There was, you previously outlined three. The, the one is the post-colonial narrative of the third world country struggling away yeah. from the colonial powers. There was the communist narrative and there was obviously the Western democratic project. And we, we all know that Francis Fukuyama declared the end of history. The end, everything was over when Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall fell and then Western democracy had prevailed and the, the old colonial powers crumbled and yeah. we lived happily forever. And that turned out not to be True. Well, although, yeah, <laughs> let's so let's get into so Fukuyama, he's a little bit misread. And, and uh, I actually he's, a, he, I find him a lot more interesting than that essay, than the way that essay got received. Um, and then the way people read the book that he wrote out of that essay in 1992. Um, which, by the way, adds a question mark to the title. 
his yes. he, he, he's he's opening up a way of thinking rather than being as declarative as people thought he was going to be and you have to remember when he wrote that original version of that essay uh he didn't see the berlin wall coming uh it was written in the spring of 89 published in the summer i believe of 89 it was only uh the events that triggered the meaning in fact it was written before Tiananmen square right um anyway that's but it's true it, it people then imagined a one world end of history end of ideology moment that we'd entered into a whole new planetary ecumene and to make things even more messy that coincided with the globalization of the addiction to carbon carbon-based fuels right so uh globalization was on and so was our commitment to double down on coal and oil and gas and we lit a bomb under the very system that we thought you know was going to transcend all the old ideologies so how would you think about different stages of globalization or global interdependence i was watching one of the lectures you gave and you actually started with the year if i remember correctly 1893 at the world fair when you had talked about historian frederick Jackson Turner was saying the yeah. declare of the end of American frontier. And then there was all kinds of new wars and conflicts that popped up and that eventually uh, ended with the dropping of the nu nuclear bomb. And then we had another wave of global uh, globalization after the Cold War and so on. So how, how do you define the biggest stages of this? Yeah, I mean, if we took the really long sweep, of course, one might say, and you can hear this narrative getting retread now that there is a there that there have been many phases of what we now call globalization. I mean, globalization as a term, um, uh, it, to my from what I know, it first got deployed in 1980 in a report by a commission chaired by the former West, West German government, a man called Willy Brandt, a report called the North South. Uh, I won't go into details. It then gets reimagined, of course, as a kind of and often confused with neoliberalism after 1989, <clears throat> as if there was only one form of globalization. And in fact, but if we think about globalization as a process of interdependence across regions and states, then this has been going on for a long time, just with different kinds of actors and institutions and ideologies that provided the moorings for it. So one might say that the Silk Road, and this is the one that's coming back now, as we're trying to imagine what a more Sinocentric global order might look like. And that's of course why Belt and Road, uh, I'm sure you guys talk about this a lot in the podcast, harkens back to a memory of a system that was geographically more Sinocentric and uh, across regions tethered together more by networks of exchange than by state systems, right? Um, one might say that was a really early form of globalization. I think that is not globalization. I think that is global exchange. I think that is interconnectedness, but it's not interdependence because survival, um, I, this is what I used to think, survival, and I'll explain why I'm changing my mind now, because COVID it has been an epistemological shock as well. But sur we didn't depend, we, people in Greece did not depend on people in China for their survival, for their basic sustenance. It's really interdependence we only begin to see emergence as a question of survival and of welfare in the middle of the 19th century as a byproduct of the industrial revolution. We can unpack what that means. Um, so it's a much more modern, I would call globalization or interdependence as opposed to interconnectivity, a much more modern thing. And there have been several ways. One is the one that was created by empires, mainly European, but also the Japanese empire, the Brazilian empire until 1980, until 1889, that sutured the world uh, together through these asymmetrical political structures that we call empires, right? With, with, with subaltern people being compelled to join in with metropolitans, 
uh, into this interdependent system. And that really hit its high water mark in 1914. It was a form of imperial or inter-imperial um, globalization uh, that blew up in a global civil war that ran from 1914 to 1945. And then we have a liberal model uh, stitched around ideas of self-determination, uh, semi-regulated markets, um, it's often called embedded liberalism, uh, that then runs through and then changes again, you, so let's say 1989. So you have some markers there that what we say in history is periodize modern globalization, right? And we are now, and we have been, I think we're now seeing that 2008, 2009 was another inflection point. Right, a, a moment that that closed off a long cycle, and we're living through a transition to something new. I used to say, so I started out by saying, "Oh, well, you know, you're Silk Road. It's not really interdependence." But COVID has been an epistemological shock because, of course, the Silk Road it was precisely the trading system on ships and on uh, caravans that carried the bacillus of the Black Death around. And we now know that disease transmission follows commercial corridors. Again, I think it's something that, 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 that we, we will talk about, um, which then redefines what we mean by dependency, right? That we do actually depend on strangers far away and the things that they do and vice versa without even knowing it, which is again, the narrative dilemma that we've got. So, Professor Edelman, it sounds like you, you first brought up the Silk Road system, which was centuries ago, yeah. the, the China-centric, Sino-centric video. Yeah. And, and that was, you said, global exchange and, and not global interdependence, per se. Right. What, well, that was, my, that was how I used to think about it. But then COVID blew up and then I realized, yeah. actually, this is a form of interdependence. It's biological interdependence right. of a complex system where um, germs and viruses don't acknowledge borders, right? Uh, right? They're global before we are. So we have to rethink our stories, right? And another really interesting part you, you brought up was empires, Japanese yep. empire, Roman empire, and so on. And uh, in a very recent article that you also compared, well, I, I suppose many people compare the US with the Roman empire in terms yeah. of the, the the size, the military might, and so on, yeah. and how that uh, how, how America, just like Roman Empire, ushered in uh, an age of its own globalization and global interdependence with with its own ways. So, could yeah. you unpack that idea for us a little bit, and just I guess situate us situate us where we are today in the United States, and and yeah. how, how how that compares to before? Yeah. So so. Um... I, I think one of the, um, just to pull back a little bit, one of the fallacies around early thinking around market-based interdependence um, thought that sort of imagine markets as these freestanding structures of buyers and sellers enabled by barcodes and shipping containers and Velcro and styrofoam peanuts for packing purposes, all the, the, the technologies enabled um, private agents to engage with each other across borders in ever intensifying ways. And there is an element of truth to that, you know, about, about the effects of technologies, which is again, something we can talk about some more, but they were never disembedded from the institutions that enabled them to work. And we can go through the long list of institutions, everything from the ways in which financial transactions are managed are deeply um, uh, uh, regulated. Even if we think of them as decontrolled, um, they're still embedded in, and, and in fact, the whole macroeconomic policy in China is guided by state policy. Right, and, and so we, we have to go back and think around institutions. So once we think about institutions and think about the ways in which our interdependence is embedded in institutions that manage, and we're just talking about the market, never mind the cultural, the knowledge, the biological and ecological forms of interdependence. I'm just focusing on the economic side of things and think about institutions, then we realize how important 
it was to have structures that uh, connected incentives and reward mechanisms that held the codependent, this is a little technical, but the codependent partners in um, the agreements they forge when they enter them. Some of these agreements are not voluntary, and that's why empires play this role, right, as, as, as conquerors and enforcers of this global order. The experiment that happened after 1945 was to create a voluntary system. And the way that worked was around the idea of self-determination, that people would, self-determining peoples in the form of this new entity, relatively new in the scheme of history, it's a new thing called the self-determining nation state, would co-govern with others this regime. But there was one, primus inter pares of them, which was the United States, which played the role of the backstopper for the system, sometimes overplayed its hand. In fact, a lot of times overplayed its hand, particularly in areas, this takes me back to Central America in the 1980s, where the United States was just the bully, right? That was a way to keep people in line is to step on revolutionaries' heads, right? And so it would behave imperially, even if it didn't self-identify as an empire. So that's why in a unipolar global system, people analogize between the kind of order that the United States oversaw, particularly after 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they analogize to Rome. That was another world system, let's say around organized around the Mediterranean that went all the way. Um, we know that the trading links around the Roman Empire were really far and extended, right? Um, and that Rome governed um, this, uh, this uh, arrangement. There was uh, a Han system as well. Um, in fact, there were two non-competing, coexisting imperial systems at that time, let's say at around um, zero uh, AD, right? So, um, so we now draw analogies to, to uh, Rome to try to think about what unipolarity means. And what I was referring to in that piece was, you know, the paradox of, uh, of this form of unipolarity means that the very same institutions that pull the world's parts together as the engine of what we call globalization also makes it vulnerable to the shocks that come from the peripheries, right? And so one being, and this is the, I call it the Gibbon paradox, is that um, what eventually brought down the Roman empire was a disease that began in the upper Nile region. We can go into the details of what happened. And it just swept through the trading system. Um, Again, okay. we know that, that uh, epide epidemics correlate with commercial interdependence, and it happens over and over and over again. Right? It happened in the 1890s. Uh, sometimes we dodge a bullet. Right? That's what happened in the 1890s, actually. Um, we were close to having another, uh, another Black Death, I, I don't, and we can go into the details of how that worked. And it finally caught up with us now, and we're shocked because we've forgotten. I forgot, I'm a historian, I don't know these things. In fact, I teach the Black Death at the beginning of History 201, uh, but hadn't fully assimilated that how vulnerable we were to this. So that's what I mean by the epistemic shock. I guess just to kind of follow up on what you've been talking about and the vulnerabilities and everything, hmm. um, maybe speak, maybe we could talk a little bit more specifically about now. And I guess both like yep. the Trump administration, the Biden administration, I guess America's yep current role in, I guess we're not really an empire, but in this interdependence and the impact that we have. And I guess why this has made the world so vulnerable to, yeah. I guess, kind of the spread of Corona or just, yeah, I guess yeah. the, right, like the current situation and how this compares to the Roman empire um, in that way. Right. Well, I, I don't want to overstress the, the contrast with, with, that is to say that there's a very good parallel between Pax Romanica and Pax Americana. I actually don't think that they're, but it's a useful, what we call a heuristic, right? To, to think about what's going on now. 
um, among other things, there always were many more contenders and alternatives to the American system in a way that didn't really exist in, the, in, in Roman times. That is, nobody else was articulating alternative models of interdependence in the age of Pax Romanica, whereas now we do have them. Um, but, but there is a, a set of compounding issues here that you're getting at, Rebecca, which is that um, the very world that the United States uh, kind of dominated after 1945, and I mean dominated in a neutral way, not as a kind of uh, uh, normative way. Um, it is domination when 60% of the world's industrial output takes place in one country. That's just dominance. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the United States gets to sh shower the world with with its, uh, with its weaponry, but it does give it a kind of clout that the world had never seen and would never see again, right? But was able to fashion a world in its own mind's eye as a result. And everybody was very compliant, joined in, especially since some of its vocabulary and its principles had enormous appeal, like liberalism was an important antidote to fascism, like anti-colonialism, which the United States was up to a point anyway, an advocate of the dismantling of European and Japanese empires. We could, we could go on. The result though was, and this is to get us to Trump and, and Biden, which is what you were pushing me to do. I see, notice how historians do this. They go back to the past and let's kind of retread that, that, that tire. Um, so let's let's hurry up to the present then. The, the, the difficulty is we have an interdependent system, but that old guardian model um, was in fact so successful that it became obsolete, right? That um, the world economy is so decentered, but market-based. Um, everybody is addicted to carbon, based fuels. Uh, it, you could never have dreamed of this in 1945. You would have thought if you told Truman, well, you're going to, um, you know, approve uh, the articles for the creation of the Bretton Woods system, maybe something we want to talk about. Uh, and it's going to create the architecture for managing the world economy. Uh, they, this, this, what we've got now would have been just a fantasy, right? Um, it's been globalized, but the nature of the successful form of globalization has created these perverse effects, which is that the United States can't control it the way it used to. And we're all dependent on, on, on carbon-based fuels. I mean, that's an existential threat to, to the planet. And, um, and one might say that we are the victims of the success of that model, right? So the predicament for Biden. So one response is, of course, to go back to the nation state, right? Rebuild the muscles of the nation state, make America great again. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, that, that was one response. Now I understand where yeah. it was coming from, right? It was a, a fantasy, it was just a fantasy. Uh, by a fantasist, actually, and a lot of people, but in the absence of a good liberal response, and I think one of the cringeworthy parts of the 2016 election campaigns was to watch Hillary Clinton simply unable to defend even the principles, never mind the policies and practices of the administrations that she was associated with, which were Bill Clinton's and Barack Obama's. So if you go back and replay the tapes of uh, Trump lashing out against TPP and against NAFTA, the North American Free Trade uh, a, a Agreement, uh, the first uh, NAFTA being ne negotiated first by Bush, but ratified under, under, uh, under Clinton, Bill Clinton, and then TPP being an agreement that was negotiated under her administration as Secretary of State, not necessarily by her, but by the Obama, she could not defend that. She had no answer. She yeah. had no narrative. She had no 
so the, I, you know, it's like watching liberalism commit suicide in front of <laughs> an illiberal demagogue. Uh, yeah. And that was revealing that, that liberals have, the, the crisis of globalization is an existential crisis for liberals. I think they, they have, if I can be provocative here, they have, um, Donald Trump, uh, gave them a quick way out, which is it's either us liberals or it's that, you know, and we all know what that looks like. And we don't like that very much, but it's not a good response to the problem. Right. Um, and that's Biden's dilemma now, how to be a leading player in managing codependence in risky times when you're not as strong as you used to be, you can't be as strong as you used to be, right? You have to work with partnerships and so forth at a moment in which people are tired of listening to the liberal recipes or what's often called the liberal script. And yet you are a country who's committed to a, a sort of a, a, a liberal self-understanding. And this is where we see the clash with, let's say the illiberal models of integration we can go through the list of where those are coming from, but there are many of them. And that's the dilemma we're running into now. Professor Edelman, this is all just so fascinating. I think maybe to, just to quickly recap, yeah, uh, all the all the fascinating ideas you, you brought up. You, the first thing was Pax Americana, which is a very interesting thing because uh, you wrote in that article, and I should state the title of the article so people can look it up, Policy Series 2021-14, Joe Biden and the Gibbon paradox uh, it was mm. actually just published march 18th and you were writing which i find really interesting is an american grandeur functioned best when the story of the world reflected back the kind of power that americans felt most comfortable wielding yeah. exporting movies and coca-cola universities sciences its ideas about markets and civil society and, and so on so that was kind of the, the old days and, and even yeah. trump had that salesman element because yeah. you, you mentioned the story when uh, South Korean President Moon Jae-in came over to the United yep. States to visit and he, was, he wanted to talk about the nuclear deal. Yep. But then he knew that to preface the actual talk of nuclear deal, he had to buy some American natural gas and, and, and so on first. Um, so this kind of salesman mentality yep. embedded in Pax Americana, that was really interesting. But I, I think yep. to, to turn on to what you, you in response to your uh, question, uh, to Rebecca's question, um, and, and maybe I'll quote what, what you wrote in that article and, and we can dive into this. You said, for the left, it's a tale of imperial quagmire and the inevitable crash of capitalism. Uh, so for Wolfgang Streeck, uh, the yeah. German sociologist and prophet, the choice is stark, capitalism or democracy. And like many declinist postures, his pre pre presents us with one or the other scenarios, uh, purgatory or paradise. And for the right, the endless convictions have more to do with moral limitations and corruptions. Writers created Western civilizations out of a looming sense that it was in peril because humans were bound to follow the natural laws of biological deterioration. And I think th this tension was beautifully written by you. And I just wanted to hear, I guess, your thoughts on uh, a little bit more about this tension and where we're headed next, I suppose, <laughs> out of this Biden challenge. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so... So I, I hope it's clear just to simplify those 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 lines, which um, they're really complicated. I'm trying to still unpack them myself here. Uh, it, I hope you get the sense <laughs> that I, I am neither uh, a catastrophist of the left or a catastrophist of the right. I think they agree on some fundamental, i.e. this is the end of the world order as we knew it. Uh, we have to save our asses, starting with the nation, right? And, and screw the rest. And that was Trump's response to it. The left is a little more, uh, let's say, sugar-coated, um, but it's uh, the end of market-based globalization. And the only real alternative is, is let's say, revolution, a, a breakdown of the system and the creation of entirely new order. I, I never particularly persuaded by such calamitous narratives. I think what we're facing is not the end of an order, but um, growing pains. That is a transition to something else that will still carry the traits of the old order, just as the liberal scheme carried the traits of empire, right? 
uh, without necessarily knowing it and certainly not liking it when it did uh, did appear. Um, and just as globalization 3.0, which was the post 89 model, carried with it some of the earlier uh, American centric ideas of how to do this uh, and including American enforcement, um, we will carry the traits of, 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 of the previous iterations through to the next one. So the idea that history happens with these breaks and the old order is wept, wiped away and we get something entirely new, it never really works that way, much as revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries love those kinds of fictions. So instead, we're, we're going through, you know, yeah, some, some, some growing pains into something new. Um, I mean, we could talk about where the, the, the agonies are lying. I, I'm, I'm very concerned. We can go down the list. I'm concerned about nuclear proliferation. This uh, negotiations in Iran are worth watching. Um, watch, worth watching very closely because uh, weaponizing the rivalry and democratizing access to nuclear weapons changes the game uh, a lot. Okay, we can unpack that. I, so that's a tough one for Biden to, to manage, right? Um, the United States just does not have the kind of power in the Middle East that it once enjoyed for good or for ill, uh, just to name one. Um, I mean, I can I could go down the list. I mean, that, but that's that's the one. That's, it's in the headlines now because the negotiations are happening, and the Americans and the Iranians can't meet in the same room. And you know, the they have all these go-betweens, kind of crazy system of negotiating. But that's the kind of childish world that we're in. You know, where people are going to behave like babies and not talk, right? Um, right. Yeah, I guess before we go down, you know, the whole list of all of the yeah, of all issues things, that the world's yeah. facing, um, I guess, where do you maybe see the, the global, like globalization heading? What, I guess, yeah. would be your vision or where do you think, I mean, you mentioned in one of your articles, the globalization, um, we need that it's time to kind yeah. of reinvent the system. Yes. Um, and so I guess if we are in this transition, like what does the new system look like? Where yeah. where are we heading? Well, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's not, whether globalization or not, it's what kind. Um, and it's not that globalization is dead. There were lots of premature epitaphs flowing around, you know, after 2008. And then when Corona started, even I worried about the end of supply chains. Eh, the reason why the Suez Canal thing was such a big news was because there were shipping containers were packed with commodities, right? That, that yeah. And now it is true that trade as a share of global GDP had been tipping down even before 2008 and have been slowly declining ever since. But that's in large part because the global GDP has shifted so much to services anyway, that anyway, we, we could go on about decomposing the nature of the global international, you know, the international division of labor and what's happening in the world world economy. Um, but the deglobalization narrative, I thought was really premature. Um, and that's what I mean by going through, it's, it's structurally evolving and taking different forms. Um, and one of the difficulties is, of course, when you live through a transition, as you know, we all are, it's hard to have perspective. Right, and to know what story is the one that governs. We're now realizing that all those prophecies about the end of globalization were premature. And that's really about how we are re-globalizing, right? So I think the choice is more between being self-conscious globalizers with some basic principles around equity and fairness. I think we can go through what that might look like. So the globalization we need um, or be unconscious uh, globalizers and just stumble around, uh, which is going to get us into a lot of, create a lot of problems in, in, in my view. So I'm on the side of being conscious and studying history and uh, economics and applying the lessons uh, to, to what we're confronted with. That's the dilemma now, right? And I, 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 you know, I think the election 
last year, um, Biden over Trump was a vote in favor of one model over the other. You know, people were seeing that um, uh, uh, a competitive, bare knuckled approach to uh, managing interdependence was getting us nowhere good. Uh, Professor Edelman, just to quickly push back on that, if I may play that yeah. was advocate for a second. Yeah, please do. Uh, and, and just to hear how you would respond to this. It, it does seem that, um, I mean, people are saying, obviously, COVID had made us realize one is uh, yeah. epidemics come with commercialization and has also made us realize the fragility of the current system. And also, surely globalization would structurally evolve. And, and, and surely, uh, it's not just we're going to never talk to each other ever again. But I do think there are some very strong headwinds uh, towards that new vision. I mean, uh, the, the, it seems that at least from a political institution perspective, things are going more extreme, right? The divisions between different kinds yeah. of uh, systems are getting more extreme. I mean, e even if you look at China and the US, I, I think for the past few months, uh, there used to be dozens of flights going around. I mean, now it's yeah. like, I don't even know. I mean, one flight, two flights a day between the two of the biggest nations. I mean, yeah. it, 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 I think it seems that it's going to take many, many years before anything recovers, any kind of actual connection, human interaction uh, to resume. And, 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 and globalization would be uh, severely impacted uh, by yeah. that. And, and the different political responses coming out of the COVID crisis yeah. would make the ideological divisions even starker. Yeah. Well, no, I think that's a good point. Uh, I, I, um, the definition of growing pains is just here. We're just we're going to mix up our metaphors here, but the yeah. definition <laughs> of, of, of growing pains is lots of headwinds, right? Uh, um, and to make things even more complex, that the very institutions that we've relied upon for co-managing our interdependence are exhausted, right? Um, they're tired. They they. Um, and we can get into what they might, but the, the, the old treaty oriented arrangement that was very state centric and that had certain principles of sovereignty attached to them is, is, is fatigued, right? I think there are ways to think about other kinds of actors, um, private sector, civic network forms versus other, we, we can get into the details of how that works. Uh, these are all part of the difficulty, right? The growing pains or the headwinds, which is that the instruments that we use to tackle them are, are you know, they're in, they're in trouble. I don't, they're not dead, you know, uh, uh, but, but they need rebooting and reinventing. Um, the difficulty on the, on, on the China side, I mean, there are many aspects of it, but to be very simplistic for a minute is of course, the United States got very comfortable with China as a client after 1989 of that global system, um, enjoyed advising China about how to do this, that, and the other, so long as China was not, was selling cheap t-shirts and not moving into sectors where the United States might, where, where China might compete with the United States in markets and influence. And, and lo and behold, um, China wasn't gonna stay exporting t-shirts. They, they wanted to industrialize. They wanted to dot, 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 dot. Um, and therefore the very success of quote unquote, integrating China into the world order is what has created this, this kind of rivalry. Yes, it's gonna take some time. I think the, let's say the symbolics of what Trump did, but it was happening beforehand. We gotta be careful about dumping so much on Trump's lap. I mean, he deserves everything he's gonna get, possibly even jail term uh, uh, time, but, but there were problems that preceded him. And, um, I, and I do worry about uh, the kind of the, the ways in which symbolic things can get outsized. I was a little disappointed to see um, Blinken lead off uh, in the round of conversations with, um, with the, the Chinese what, two weeks ago with a sermon. I mean, I, 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 th I think Americans have to stop preaching. Um, um, it, it's not a good look. You know, the world is tired of it. Uh, and uh, even if I agreed with a lot of the substance you know, around human rights and things like that, 
more listen there are skills to managing this like listening uh, or at least pretend to be empathetic um but china or wuhan virus all that kind of stuff that has path dependent consequences and i think we're seeing these play out it's very hard to undo that um we could roll back and even say something similar happened after 1989 with the dismantling of the soviet union and the kind of gloating that went on in the quote unquote West that really put off Russian nationalists who, who felt excluded from that story. Triumph on the one hand and failure, that is their failure on the other. So I think we have to be very careful in, in, in how we talk even um, with strangers. Strangers as, as in they're not that we depend on them, they depend on us, but they're not necessarily part of our political community. That's what I mean by strangers. Right. We're familiar with them. We talk with them all the time, but they're not quote unquote us. Well, Professor, I mean, this is all, I guess, fascinating. I think maybe just to I guess, pivot slightly towards maybe what's going on um, in America specifically right now and some of this, like, I guess you're about to publish an article called like the return of the patriotic narrative. And so maybe, yep to talk a little bit more um, about this specifically. Um, and so you call it a diatribe against the resurgence of the patriotic narrative around the world. And you mentioned people like um, President, former President Barack Obama, historian Jill Lepore as advocates um, of this, I guess, nationalist patri uh, patriotism in the United States. So I guess, could you maybe outline I guess, their views on this, on these patriotic narratives and then maybe some of the more conservative perspectives on nationalism, I guess, how you see them how you see, I guess, the conversation between them, the tensions, and maybe also even how this is impacting America's society right now? Yeah. Well, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the appeal to the nation state, which I understand, the appeal to the nation state as the um, device that will shelter you <clears throat> in risky, tempestuous times. All right, and uh, but it's at odds with the nature of interdependence that we've been talking about, um, and we can go through the list of I mean, just the proliferation of vaccine nationalism, which I think is not as bad as I worried about. To be quite honest, I thought we were really going to. I could swear I won't. I thought we were going to mess this one up, over handling the pandemic. It's gone better than actually I thought it would. Now, I say that <laughs> from the point of view of the United States and as somebody who just got his first shot. If I were in Brazil and I was just interviewing somebody earlier this morning who's in Bahia and they're yeah. scared shitless, right? Yeah. You know, and uh, they're not getting any help from anybody else, starting with their own government. So, um, but just to come back to the question about, about patriotism, um, the good nation, here, here's a principle to, to work by. For nations to be good, they need other nations to be good. T to have a virtuous sense of yourself requires uh, a recognition from others, right? And a reciprocity that goes with that. When in 1776, Americans declared Americans, British colonial subjects who happened, and not even all of them, right? Uh, there were many loyalists who fled, uh, declared independence. They were also declaring interdependence. They were saying that we want to be co-members in something that Jeremy Bentham called international society that would be subject to laws and norms and mutually agreed upon uh, uh, um, obligations, right? Um, so you were never, to be independent required a new model of dependency and, and, and sharedness and, and recognition. Um, so my critique of the patriotic narrative is especially in the, and I, and I do pinpoint in particular Jill Lepore, who's, a, you know, who's a great historian who, who wants to reinvent the nation. What does she want to do? She wants to recapture progressive patriotism from the right wing nativist version of patriotism to say America has a national identity. It has a national story. It's about being open and inclusive and at least striving towards equality. One might say, She's the unofficial historian of Bidenism, 
right? And what I am saying is uh, that is not nearly enough anymore, right? That really the challenge, the narrative challenge is to, is to figure out ways to think about what is good about the nation in its relationship to something bigger that is humanity. Uh, because if we can only have a story about nations, we're backsliding, right? Um, because of the nature of interdependence that we face. And we also have to reckon with the fact that there are tens of millions of people out there and the numbers are only going to grow because of climate change and all kinds of other disruptions that are going to get uncorked once COVID is over, uh, who have no nation state at all. And I, as you know, you know, I've been working a lot on refugees in the global migrant crisis. Um, uh, if the only narrative of membership we have is a patriotic one, we are telling millions of people, you are people with no history. And that is unethical. So that piece is really an, is an effort to try to say, we have to think about the nation, but its interconnectedness and its, its, its relationship to the other parts of this wider system. I guess to quickly follow up on that, and throughout this conversation, we've been using the word narrative uh, a lot, yeah. or stories. How do we tell better narratives? And it seems that a lot of people have been saying that humans are ultimately organized by narratives enough. That's mm -hmm. why we need to have better collective narratives. And it's, do you, I guess as a scholar or historian, how do you see the value of, one might say, truth? Yeah. Uh, or, or, or because, I, especially after Trump came to power, yeah. there was so much debate about deviation from facts and truths, alternative yeah, facts. But also people say, well, alternative facts do exist outside of hard sciences because there are a lot of ways you can look at different things. And then humans are, after all, organized by narratives. So maybe truths don't ever matter that much in human society. So, so where do you see that uh, component plays out uh, as we battle uh, between patriotism and nationalism and, and so on? Yeah. Uh, well, so there's the, it, it, that's a, such a hard question. I mean, it's really kind of at the core of things. First on, we do know that narratives have social functions, right? They create shared sense of belonging, um, um, political communities that have those, um, are much easier to mobilize, to confront, to tackle shared problems. One only has to think about the ways in which Taiwan and South Korea and other countries that have had experiences with, with uh, epidemics in the past. And even in some cases in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Ebola memory was very important for understanding the purpose of togetherness. So societies with strong in-group identifications with a shared narrative are ones that are often more resilient. They, they, they pay a price, right? Which is they're often more, and again, I'm, I'm using this as a, as a heuristic, but let's just say they're more closed. Uh, they're more conservative often. Uh, and so there's, there are trade-offs here. Um, another function, uh, narratives, shared understandings. Um, you'll, this is for you, Tiger, as an econ major, they reduce transaction costs, right? And, and yes. so they, <laughs> and, we, and we can go down the list of, of what narratives do. And there is a whole field now called narrative economics. I don't know if you've read Robert Schiller's uh, latest book. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting book. I disagree with him on a lot of paths, but he's onto something, <laughs> Yeah, right? Um, stories also create all kinds of pathologies. If you read the book and he's got some good examples uh, uh, of how they constrain people from open thinking. So uh, one takeaway is a vote for, uh, let's say cognitive openness, all right? To be open to, aware of, receptive of disconfirming evidence, all right? Don't think you're so right all the time. This is why I, I didn't like that Blinken preachy tone. Like we have a monopoly over virtue. Guys, uh, that, that doesn't help the conversation. And it doesn't help us to go, Tiger, to your question. If we are truth seekers, um, we have to be open to the possibility that we are really wrong sometimes. And not double down on our truths. That also makes us better listeners for the people who don't necessarily identify with our truth. 
which is again, part of the difficulty liberals had with nativists. I, so where I agree with Lepore on the need for rethinking the national narrative is to have a response to the nativists, right? Not to abandon the nation to um, ethno-nationalism. My problem is that she tries to reclaim it, but abandons everything else like the planet, right? So, uh, so openness is, is one way of, 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 of answering your question. So it's more of a kind of epistemological stand, you know, um, and risk-taking and, while at the same time being uncertain. So not let the risks paralyze you. This is what's called proving Hamlet wrong. Uh, Albert Hirschman. There you yeah. go. <laughs> All ties back. back. So. so don't let the fact that you're not certain inhibit action. Right. So Hamlet, do I know? Do I not know? I don't. How do I know? And then he doesn't do. Right. Prove Hamlet wrong by accepting uncertainty, not as something that um, inhibits you from doing something in the world, but accepting your limits, doing something in the world and learning from what you do, including your mistakes. And, and allowing that doubt to spur the action rather yes. than inhibit you from that. Yes. That's right. That's right. Um, it doesn't mean yeah. being mindless and ignorant and going out and just kind of smashing China, but, but uh, uh, in fact, it's about being mindful. Um, um, right. And so I guess to kind of bring in another uh, perspective on these like narratives, you, um, you mentioned Hannah um, Arendt at the end of um, your article and you talk about like her appeal for new narratives as like this guiding yeah. principle. So I wonder if maybe you could kind of elaborate on that, expand on that, how that fits into this as yeah. well. So I'm a big Hannah Arendt uh, reader. I'm also, uh, there. it's important to, to historic, what we say in history is to historicize her, to see her as the product of a certain age, right? Um, that line that I borrow is from a book that she wrote after the Second World War. In fact, she was writing it during the Second World War as a refugee, uh, from Jewish refugee from Germany, um, and reflecting on the power of states um, over, uh, over people. And what she says after 1945 in the wreckage that nationalism had produced right, is, we may still need to have a world that's governed by interlocking nation states, right? Um, but let's not, uh, let's not think that that's the only world available to us because there are challenges um, and uh, that nation states on their own cannot address. What's more is we are going to need structures international structures, international narratives, principles and ethics, right, that constrain the states from doing bad things. And if you've come out of a world, as she did of the 1930s and 40s, and you witness states doing in the name of the nation, truly horrible things, you realize that she's kind of find uh, new moorings, right? Um, and, you know, for her coming as a, as, as a Jew, uh, this was really important for informing her, her, let's say, her stance on ethics and politics, right? That we need national sovereignty, but we have to think beyond it. And so she called for a new imaginary, right? Something international, something in the name of humanity. This is why, by the way, if you fast forward and you read her, another one of her amazing books, which is about Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, which really kind of set off a debate around the Holocaust. Uh, one of her complaints about that trial against uh, Adolf Eichmann that was taking place in Israel, 1962, I believe, uh, is uh, that it was a trial that took place in the, in the name by a nation state, 
which was the state of Israel, and in the name of one peoples, the Jewish peoples. Whereas she really wanted the trial to take place as a symbol for humanity, right? And not just in the name of one people only. Um, that got her into a lot of hot water, I, I should say. Um, but so she was always somebody trying to think with and across the power of a world of nation states. Right? Why just, that's why one of the reasons why she's an interesting person to read. P Professor Edelman, I know we don't have too much time left and we t t went through so many different topics. I think one other theme I would love to quickly hear your thoughts on is you, you wrote this piece in Project Syndicate titled The New History Wars. It was back yep. in September of 2020. And you commented on the movement to remove public monuments. And obviously at Princeton, we had something quite close to yep. campus that uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was one of the, the probably the most famous alum of Princeton and was the president of the university, his name was removed from the School of Public International Affairs. And yep. so now we don't call it Woody Woo Woodrow Wilson School anymore. So uh, because of his past with slavery and so on. So. I, uh, not with slavery, sorry, with, with um, uh, these kinds of related, racial related attentions. Yeah. But, but yeah. I guess um, to, to quickly pivot to that part, you, you did mention in that article, which is the line I quoted, which is the, at the beginning of the interview, we're caught in between an, an outdated style of patriotism and a fatigued pluralist narrative and so yeah. on. So maybe would you mind quickly capturing the, some of the main points you made in that argument and what you saw yeah. the movements, the social movements that happened in the past year, what those movements really signified. Right. So I think one of the difficulties, and it comes, it, it returns to something that Rebecca had, had asked about, is how do we exchange stories? And so you're an economist, Tiger, you worry about exchanging commodities, and the, we're also exchanging stories all the time, how to exchange stories across borders. And these borders may be geographic right, between states or uh, nation states uh, um, but they can also be um, you know cultural and epistemological and uh, one of the ways and it's kind of a takeaway or maybe a through line for the things that we've been talking about is is that um, our ability to exchange stories um, across divides or across borders our ability to do that will determine our ability to co-govern interdependence. So the part that I'm referring to on, in that piece that, that you talked about from Project Syndicate um, that kind of wound up getting syndicated all over the world um, as a kind of uh, editorial was really to say that in, in the struggle over memories, Right. And in the United States, it was a very particularized form of memories of memories of the Civil War, to some extent, memories of colonization. And this is the Christopher Columbus statues coming down and so on, um, is an opportunity uh, not just to erase emblems of the past, but to have an open discussion about them. Because some people identify with those monuments. Taking down the monument isn't going to take away their self-identification. In fact, if anything, it may redouble it, right? And give it a, uh, uh, an afterlife that's, that can become very toxic. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to agree and hold hands and sing Kumbaya together with the people who want to have you know, civil war generals uh, still up on their pedestals. Um, but they have to, at the very, here's the punchline of the piece, feel that at least their narrative has been recognized, disagreed with, uh, maybe challenged in the history textbooks. That's what I do, um, but heard, right? And, 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 and understood as some as an as a narrative that they have coupled to their sense of self in the world. If you uh, disavow it, silence it, erase it, uh, we know from African American history. Just to take an example, doesn't mean it goes away. Just because black memories were repressed, doesn't mean that they went away. In fact, they fuel the resistance in many many forms, from civil rights to Black Lives Matter. 
Um, I don't want to see white nativism uh, become a narrative of heroic resistance. Uh, and so one way to get around that is, um, is to develop these narrative exchange skills and begin the process of, if not exchange, possibly even of, of, of disconfirming some of the underlying claims that are made in those stories, right? So that the people who hold those racist stories dear don't feel that their own sense of entire self is being at risk and imperiled by having a conversation with someone they don't agree with. Because right now, that's what we've got. People are not talking to each other. They don't even know how to talk to each other. They just shout. And that concerns me. Professor Edelman, one quick follow up from that. And Rebecca and I were also discussing this before the interview. So Trump did this thing, the 19, 1776 commission, the great yeah. statue reckoning with some of the examples of what you describe as a weaponization of, of history. And, um, and this is perhaps a, a naive conception from my conversation with my undergraduate friends, but I would love to hear your thoughts on which is kids these days, we often say, it's a very popular phrase amongst kids to say we're in a postmodern society nowadays. Yeah. And in postmodern society, things are a little bit more destructive than generative, meaning um, academia, the way we create knowledge is less about building blocks, but rather more about melting things away or challenging previous conceptions of hierarchies or so on. And when we look at, uh, and, and, and a lot of intellectuals um, on the different parts of the spectrum with, with the political spectrum would say, ah, critical race theory, whatever, these are all very critical and destructive rather than generative. And the act of tearing down those statues, that process itself, that destruction itself, uh, doesn't make people feel comfortable and so on, even though the message, the, the, the substance is good. So mm -hmm. I, I would love to hear your thoughts on how, how you see this tension on, on that end. What, whether you think we, we are indeed in an in a, in a, in a age where yeah. as we reconcile with history, it's a little bit more destructive. I, I, that's a hard question. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, so I'm going to end on uncertainty. I, I, yeah. I think that's a question to pose, right? Um, uh, whether we live in, in a post-truth age, I think is, is kind of what you're, and that everything is relative and everybody can have their own quote unquote truth. So we've gone from a capital T truth age to a proliferation of uh, the small T truths. Um, you know, part of me, uh, uh, says, no, we can falsify and we can verify and we can disconfirm and we have those powers. And it's something that we develop at these institutions called universities, which I believe in. And, uh, and, and those are vital skills for survival in the knowledge age. Um, so part of me says, no, uh, that, that we still live um, in an age of let's call it objectivity, where there is an agreement about what standards of truth are. Um, and if no other reason than science in the service of getting, taking care of this pandemic is a reminder of that. Okay, so a big part of me is on that side, but another part of me is uh, it's, it, it's not accepting multiple truths as much as it's, it's, it's thinking openly about the voices that participate in the conversation about the making of that truth. So, and here we we're seeing with, with this with the th problem of vaccine skepticism, right? And people who have, in my view, crazy ideas, right? And I'm, maybe some people will listen and, oh, Edelman's, you know, being hypocritical. Here he is, he's calling skeptics crazies when before he was talking about being open-minded and listening, um, but f fair enough. Uh, but I think, there we have to think about what is the truth of somebody who um, believe who's a vaccine skeptic, right? What what status do we allocate to that truth? Right? Does it have to be an objective in order to be a truth? So I think we have to have a more sophisticated conversation about what those kinds of claims are again in order to and for me i believe in 
public health and I want us to have, you know, I want to have a class with you guys in the freaking classroom. And I don't want some denialists to be the reason why I can't be in a classroom with you. But that denialist is playing the role of the spoiler. But I'm not going to be able to beat the denialist over the head. So I've got to do it through persuasion. And how do we do that? Well, some of the tools I just talked about. So um, I think we have to be more sophisticated, just as we're going to have to learn to be more sophisticated in how we think about sovereignty and interdependence. We have to do the same thing when it comes to arguing with our neighbors, right? Um, in ways that don't pose things relentlessly in these terrible dichotomies. And so if I'm a defensive denialist, I'll just double down on my bullshit theory about science, right? And, and everybody else can pay for that because that's what they wind up doing. It's got externalizing the costs and internalizing the benefits. And that's a recipe for disaster. Wow. Okay. So there's, I guess, a lot to, to think about here. Um, although I do think we're basically almost out of time. Yeah. Everybody's <laughs> falling asleep on us here. Uh, it's been an hour and a half. Guys, please. <laughs> so it's I guess to healthy. kind of maybe, I don't know, wrap this up a little bit, since the sure. name of our show is Policy Punchline, I yep. do have to ask from everything we've discussed here today, from the global interdependence to the nationalism, to, I guess, America, to history and learning from, I guess, learning from the his, like history and what has occurred, I guess, what would you say is the punchline um, from it all? Uh, I, I that, ooh, that's a tough one. Punchline. Um, I, I, I think I, it's, it's I, I've said this before, but it's, it's complexity. Um, embrace complexity. Uh, and therefore it means you're only gonna be you're only going to have insight into parts in a truly complex system. So it means, and since we're all learners together, we're at a university where we are part of a complex system that produces knowledge, for which we provide parts, right? Think of it perhaps even as a division of labor in Ricardian terms. This is kind of in Tiger's bailiwick, but, um, we are, we are codependent also in this, in, in this complex amalgam. And if we can think in complex ways, we will have more resilient, more sustainable, and I think more equitable um, arrangements. And we have to get used, that's why the simplicity of the nation, I, I think it's the, you know, it's the cheap way out of the problem, right? Yes, it's, it's a necessary, but it is so far from a sufficient condition for thinking about tackling um, problems of, uh, you know, our shared dilemmas. And so I, you know, key word to take away, let's go with complexity. Professor Edelman, how can our listeners follow your work? Uh, it's all so fascinating. I have your 2013 book here uh, about yeah. Albert Hirschman, which is often cited. And, and by the way, I mentioned this to you at, in my email to you. I was doing this interview with uh, the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, Rob Johnson, and he was talking about Albert Hirschman and he was saying uh, Princeton historian Jer Jeremy Edelman's book, you should totally go read it. And I, I got the book from the library. I mean, unfortunately, it doesn't have a fancy cover that I could show to, yeah. to our to our viewers uh, on YouTube. But besides this, anything else people should be expecting from you? Where can they find you? Uh, are you on the historical Twitter? Or, or <laughs> I don't actually do social media. Yeah. I, uh, I do a lot of online educating, but uh, I've even scaled way back on my Facebook uh, page. Yeah. <laughs> I, but no, I don't. And so um there's not really any clearinghouse for this for me. I'm not that prolific, so there's not like a whole lot to follow. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, so I, 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 I wouldn't, I don't know where one would, yes, I would just Google me once in a while to yeah. see what <laughs> lately has, has popped up. I do, I publish in Aeon Magazine and Project Syndicate. You can usually go there for pieces yes. I could do. Okay do three or four a year. Uh, there's a French think tank called the Institut Montaigne, which is a kind of group of European liberals that I 
publish a fair amount there. There are a few go-to spots. Um, uh, History 201, you know. For the, <laughs> Take the class. Uh, you have access to that, uh, <laughs> which I will be teaching in the fall. And, and uh, I will teach another course in the spring. I'm not yet sure of the title of the course. Uh, what is I, History 201, by the way? I, I, I actually don't history know. History 201 is a history of the world uh, from history 1300, the from the Silk Road and Genghis Khan to the present. And then I, in the spring, I will teach a history of global capitalism. Wow. Global uh, capitalism. Yeah. So, although I have to say, I, I sometimes I, I, I debate because I also want to teach global socialism. So if I only did capitalism, people wouldn't understand that there were for a long period of history uh, alternatives out there that were in fact what kept capitalism going right was yeah. because it had to respond to the threat of socialism uh anyway that's that'll be a spring course so people can can go there too you can name in a global history of capitalism and socialism or something <laughs> well I, I thought about you know the history of the economy yeah. um that's probably we're going to wind up what is the economy Right. And it goes to this thing with that, that Rebecca has been signaling, which is about how to think about interdependence um, and make that the, the kind of thematic through this. We, we, we did not get the chance to talk about capitalism with, with you this time, but maybe another time. But another Professor time. Edelman, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I, anyways, it's th just been such a wonderful conversation. So thank, thank you, you so guys. Much. It was great treat and uh, look forward to staying in touch. And Rebecca, thanks so much for co-hosting the interview for, with me. Thank you for having me. And yes, thank you, Professor Edelman. This was fascinating, like a fascinating conversation. I very much enjoyed okay. it. Take care, guys. Good luck in spring semester. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Professor Edelman, do you have another couple minutes to catch up as, as I end the sure. recording for this one? Absolutely. I'll, I'll just quickly end the recording here. So uh, thank you so much for, for listening today. You can follow us on policypunchline.com, watch us this video on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, any podcasting platform you may prefer. You can find this conversation and uh, go follow Professor Edelman's uh, work and buy his book about Albert Hirschman. It's, it's a long read, but I, I still think a lot of the lessons coming out of this book are still very timely today. So thank you so much for listening today. We'll see you next next time. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.